Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome to a new webinar of the, of the EPIC project about the narrative of a human-based system to welcome refugees uh, from Ukraine. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Patricia Martinez. I'm project manager at AIDL, and uh, I represent one of the 16 partners that are members of the EPIC project, the European Platform of Integrating Cities funded by the Asylum Migration and, and Integration Fund. In uh, EPI, we have been organizing in previous months a series of uh, webinars around the importance of narrative to avoid uh, misperceptions, to fight against discrimination, but also the importance of narrative to push for the design of adequate uh, policies in Europe. And in the context uh, that we are actually living uh, nowadays, we decided to organize these uh, webinars, uh, first of all, to, to stand in solidarity with the people from Ukraine, with the million of uh, displaced people from their homes. And secondly, because we wanted to take this opportunity to discuss what we think are some not obvious uh, aspects, but very critical on when it comes to, to hosting uh, refugees, such as how to put the focus on a human-based uh, narrative when designing and, and implementing integration uh, policies, not only from the from the first moment of reception that we are uh, living since in the last weeks, but also in the medium and in the and in the longer term. So before we go ahead to to have a very interesting uh, presentation, panel presentation and and debate, uh, just a few um, housekeeping rules. Please uh, keep yourself uh, muted when you are not uh, when you're not speaking. Um, we encourage you nowadays to to use the uh, the chat box that you can find at the at the bottom of the of the screen to ask a question during the session to our panelists. We will have a Q and A section at, at midterm and at the end of the of the webinar. And uh, lastly, also to mention that uh, this uh, webinar has been recorded for uh, communication reasons. So if anybody doesn't wish to, to appear, please uh, either uh, turn off your camera or uh, send us a message so that we take the, this into account. Um, so without further ado, first of all, I would like to give the floor to the project coordinator of, of EPIC, to our colleague uh, Dolinda Cavallo from, from ALDA an organization that has been uh, in the last weeks uh, dedicating, devoting a lot of time and, and efforts to support the, the local um, partners on, on the ground um, in, the, in the current uh, humanitarian crisis. Hi, Dolinda, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Um, uh, I will be very quick. So I'm Dorinda Cavallo, uh, project coordinator of APIC from ALDA, European Association for Local Democracy. And we have, I mean, thank you uh, all for being here. Thank you to the guests and to the participants. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, just to say a few words because uh, um, APIC, the APIC project gather uh, a very enthusiastic group of uh, uh, municipalities and NGOs from eight cities. And uh, uh, we have, and we, all the partners of the project are very much engaged in uh, welcoming refugees uh, from the Ukrainian, after the Ukrainian conflict, but uh, also beyond the, the conflict. And uh, uh, we have decided together to, to have this moment together and to have a moment to share our experiences and also to discuss with people who are experiencing the conflict uh, from the field. So it's a very important moment for us and uh, I hope it's gonna be a moment of reflection and sharing also for the participants. And so to do this, I will now uh, give the floor to Christoph from Kitev. Kitev is one of the partner of, uh, of the project. Uh, of EPIC, uh, who will uh, will start the, the conversation and the reflection, introducing uh, a colleague uh, of Kitev. So thank you so much and uh, uh, a nice webinar for 
all of us. Thank you, Dolinda, for the, for the invitation. Hello to everybody. Um, I, I have uh, to start, probably I'm really uh, ashamed um, somehow at what's going on. We are working for longer time together on the civil society, but even in artistical and, um, and urbanistic uh, field together with our colleagues and um, friends from, from, from Ukraine. And um, it was in the past always such much uh, inspiring how, how, how this going on and how much engagement they put on to, to, to shape their, their, their society and even their understanding of um, a, a, new, uh, a new generation or a new, new Ukraine, what they will be for. And it was uh, uh, for us somehow really avant-garde. Um, and um, so for, for we, we, didn't, we, we, we did not expect that now uh, somehow we will have the, 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 uh, our colleagues somehow as, as, as refugees here again in Germany. It would even not call, we learned a lot about our past experience to working together with refugees. We called it not anymore refugees. We would say the, our, so many guests from Ukraine that we have here in, 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 in Germany, but the, so for that, for, for, for in, 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 in this, in this uh, view, probably everybody, or I start from myself, we try to, to do the best to host, uh, even in our private field, but even in, in what we uh, are uh, able to do to, to with, with, with KITEF as a situation, but even uh, together somehow uh, with the uh, local authorities, with the municipality, to try, we try to do the best how, uh, wherever we can. But um, we, 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 in, in the last time, let's say, before it was um, a kind of cooperation uh, uh, to build somehow to, 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 to help each other. But now I think we, 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 we change a bit the idea and how we can, uh, in the actual situation, make local events by invi I'm inviting uh, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine experts, uh, artists, Online, we made them a lot of experience in the COVID time to, 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 to be able to invite uh, even online. They don't have to be physically present uh, by these events to make some panel discussions, online panel, and to pay them the fees what we are normally would pay for German artists or German colleagues. So we try to make a many, many as, as possible uh, 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 Ukrainian, under the Ukrainian topic events. And that's why uh, we give even the management or the coordination to our colleagues. And it's, that's why I, I will introduce now um, Kate from Kulturna Medialna from Nipro, since we are working long time and many years together. And um, we are proud because I think even we in Germany need a, a new kind of understanding of democracy under this condition, because uh, we was thinking, or let's say that, that Germany was thinking they can change uh, Russia with economical relation, but it happens the opposite. Russia was able to influence with corruption the German uh, uh, politics. This is uh, somehow a fact and how we, how we act under this condition, even from the civil society field. So it is really, an, uh, and how we, how we fight against, this is a new form, a kind for us, even a, a new form from anti-fascistic work, what we try to do. So I would really like to give the, work, uh, the word to, to Kate um, um, from, from Nipro. And thank you, Kate, that you join in from Nipro di directly. Yeah, Chris, uh, for, uh, thank you for a uh, short introduction and thank you for having me here. Uh, that's true, we have a long history together with Kitev and actually uh, Kitev, uh, Kristof and Agnieszka witnessed uh, a lot of uh, our struggles and uh, a lot of successful stories. Uh, right now I'm in Dnipro, it's a, a city in the central east part of Ukraine. Uh, we are still here with colleagues, uh, with some of our colleagues. Uh, we uh, have a center of contemporary art, uh, like new institution, which now transformed to a social, uh, social uh, temporary social hub uh, and humanitarian hub. Uh, and by the way, I uh, also wanted to say that um, happy to see my colleague Yulia Krivich, who is originally from Dnipro, <laughs> yes. and we just recently also uh, had a talk which also related to the uh, main topic. 
so yeah, uh, we very grateful to all our European partners and some people who we just uh, met recently uh, with all this support, uh, with uh, support uh, uh, resettling or uh, helping refugees, but uh, as well helping those who are still in Ukraine. And that's also one of the main uh, points because we are still have a lot of people who are here from the cultural sector because they are not able to cross the borders uh, either because they are males uh, or because they need to stay in Ukraine. That's why we also, uh, with Kristofa Nagnieszka, with Kitev, uh, we decided to, on, on the example of our program, now I will explain how we're trying to work with uh, a cultural program. Uh, so we decided to make a series of events, uh, which will be held by Kitev in Oberhausen. It's around like 10 events, uh, hybrid formats, uh, where uh, part of participants are online and part of participants from Ukraine offline, those who are already in uh, Germany or in some neighbors uh, countries. All the topics, uh, what we are trying to rise and talk about are obviously related with Ukraine, Ukrainian context, uh, cultural context, and also attitude and relationship with Europe. Uh, yeah, so uh, the main things that we are trying to discuss, it's actually transformation of cultural sector uh, during the war, war uh, how to protect uh, uh, cultural heritage during the war, uh, different kind of instruments, uh, tools like, for example, posters, stickers, or uh, animation, uh, which also works as a tool of resistance. So uh, our main goal is actually to help cultural workers and artists who is now out, like they don't have projects, of course, most, most of them, to support them, to give them work, to give them uh, word, uh, like to, ha to, to give them opportunity to talk and to give them opportunity to tell about the, uh, no, about the uh, present situation here, which is changes obviously uh, every day. Uh, what I will also want to mention like shortly that uh, or, of course there are some sensitive uh, issues. Um, for example, vocabulary. Uh, that's what we dealt, that's, that's kind of problem we have as a cultural workers and the people from Ukraine. For example, uh, conflict, that's, or Putin's war, that's not the right thing that uh, for us, it's, um, it, that's actually war, like real war, it's not Putin's war because thousands of people, Russian soldiers killing here females, kids, uh, citizens, civilians, every day, everywhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Mm. Yeah, sorry, this is a sensitive, sensitive question. Um, the same question with um, mm -mm -mm. making uh, round tables with uh, Russian uh, cultural uh, representatives. Not a good idea also for Ukrainians right now. We are not ready to have round tables. Uh, seriously, it's like very painful issue for all the people who now uh, struggle. I'm sorry that I'm like very tough with some answers, but uh, probably I, I need to be, you know, like short and direct. <laughs> we, we understand the willing of uh, European organizations to help and we understand the willing to even like maybe to build this kind of space to talk for people from Belarus or from Russia or from Ukraine. But the problem is that it's not a time, uh, like because we have a real uh, fighting right now, we have real war uh, going on, uh, like in Dnipro rockets are hitting the city every second day. Uh, so uh, we are not ready for round tables, even maybe with opposition. Believe me, all of us, we have uh, friends, uh, relatives, or some people from Russia. Uh, we know some people who are really in opposition, but there are not so many. And even like those people who now flee to Europe, 
uh, it's better to check first uh, if they're really from opposition, if they really uh, were not silent, because most of the people, that's, that's the problem, that most of the people, they were silent, even those who are not supporting the war, that's not the time just to say no to war. It's actually time to say no, no to this regime, no to this uh, policy, not to this government. And uh, that's, that's the main problem that we have now. And um, when I'm talking to some other partners in Europe, there were already like few cases when uh, our partners with a good willing, they were asking us if we can make a concert and invite Russian musicians. Uh, I don't think that any anyone from Ukraine now uh, will say yes. <laughs> like, I don't know, there is also my colleague uh, Yulia who probably will add then also to this, that just uh, two, uh, two very sensitive and painful uh, things when you're thinking about uh, some events uh, in Europe, that's a thing that you have to keep in mind. Thank you very much, uh, Kate. I think that what you are saying is super relevant. Thank you because I, I can understand that it's like difficult for you to share uh, to share these things in the situation that you are going through. But I think that this is very important to raise awareness on the use of the correct narratives and the correct words to be sensitive with uh, with the Ukrainian people on what uh, what is currently happening. Um, I, I know that you need to, to leave uh, very soon because of, uh, um, I, I hope you can stay still a bit uh, longer and perhaps then we can exchange also after the intervention from, from Julia, from Hania, because as you said, I think uh, they are going to set a lot of things that are complementary with what you, Kate, started to, to share with us. Thanks a lot. Uh, please stay and if you have to, to leave us, um, take good care. Uh, we hope to, to see you and to hear from you very, very soon, Kate. Thank you very much. Okay, so now uh, please feel free to, to share your uh, comments or your questions in the, in the chat. We are starting the webinar. We will have more time for, to go more into the debate and extend uh, later on. But now I would like to, to give the floor to our colleague from the EPIC project, Marta, Marta Sitiarek, where I see you in my screen here. Marta Sitiarek from the metropolitan area of, uh, of Dansk, uh, who has actually been the, the brain uh, behind this, uh, this webinar, the one uh, mobilizing and, and finding our uh, bright uh, keynote speaker for, for today. Um, Marta, you've been uh, well on the front line witnessing uh, many things of this uh, consequence of the war, not, not conflict, um, as Kate uh, said, um, and also from since the last year, uh, not only with uh, for the war of Ukraine, but also from last year with the situation in between uh, Poland and, and, and Belarus uh, border, which I know is a topic very close to, to your heart and that you've been working exhaustive uh, in, in the last month. So I would like now to, to give you the, the floor, Marta, to please share a few words with us. And then if you can please also introduce to, to Julia and to, and to Hania. Okay, so uh, thank you, Patricia, and thank you all for, for, uh, for sharing and of course for Katrina's uh, contribution. And yes, I, I, I fully agree. And, uh, and uh, I, as you, Patricia said, our inputs will be will be around the topic, but 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 not not only about what we speak and how we speak and how we can provide safe spaces for us, but also on the very general level, I'd like to say that this is extremely hard time and uh, and uh, the tension is very high and it's a survival mode, I would say. And I uh, and I'm speaking for myself, being in a safe place. So so. Um, so uh, it's very emotional time too. And uh, somehow I think that we are all in actions, you know, and there is not much time to reflect, but also when you start to reflect, you can get very angry because everything is very sensitive, yes. So speaking is a risk and non-speaking is a risk and everything is kind of like we say it in Polish, thin ice. Yes, so this is, this is a very, very 
difficult situation I think we are in and uh, and for myself I, I feel so every day is very very sensitive so what I would like to say uh, today and uh, you know what I've been observing so I am I am working on a political level let's say at the regional level and uh, I am I am responsible for migration policy here and I've been helpless, yes, so so I've been helpless, I can say for sure. This is the, the feeling that's been uh, with me for all this, uh, all these days. And, uh, and uh, in EPIC, what I've been introducing um, was the human rights approach to, to how we plan our activities. This was my, let's say what I came with uh, and, uh, and uh, it was about, you know, how we look at processes, how we design processes, when we interact with people, when we engage people, how we, you know, what we really do when it comes to migration, yes, and, uh, and how we do it and uh, what is our mindset around it? Is it about equality? Is it about inclusion? Can we look at others as partners, as stakeholders, or do we stick to a, help paradigm you know is it, is it is it about rights or is it about being the good one who helps you know the helpless yes yeah, so 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 what i wanted to 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 and also when planning our pilot project it was about trying to look at people as stakeholders and trying to be engaging and and uh, and in a partnership so this was this was it and obviously i mean since day one uh, uh, after February 24, I could see, you know, this this response to to Ukraine war, to war in Ukraine, and uh, uh, as a very much this um, lacking of rights approach. Yes, so so you know, so it's a response that is like uh, it's it's very chaotic and it it is. Uh, it's uh, it lacks a system. It, it it I see people at the border who they may be safe in time in terms of like you know in 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 the geographically speaking behind the border they can be safer than back in Ukraine. But I see people left to their own you know decisions and you know lack of information and lack of coordination and lack of safe spaces and safe transportations and and all that so so i've been i've been very very um how to say helpless but also disappointed and also also it's very natural because where would this based uh, response come from you know how how was it how, where would you know what 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 basis do we have for this to be more you know partners partner oriented in terms of do you see a person who is running away from war and you know that it's your obligation to deliver rights Yes, a right to 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 you know to to safety and uh, to to information and to their own uh, decision making in the situation and uh, so everything that has happened has been very much in a paradigm and charity or you know in charity paradigm so people end up you know in in the homes and like uh, being helped uh, in a way that is not coordinated and we don't know the future and everyone is very tense and very anxious and uh, and uh, you know whichever um, wh wherever you look at you don't know what you are really looking at and what will be happening tomorrow and where is this going and uh, and uh, i know we will be fine because somehow you know it's like we are kind of a community let's um, nothing really really <laughs> bad will happen but but it's not a it's not a good response i would say and uh, and uh, we don't use the expertise of of um, of unhcr for example yes where you have experts of you know emergency response and really looking into it in a more sustainable way so so i am worried obviously and uh, and uh, I, um, from this personal experience, uh, you know, with Julia, we went to uh, to uh, to Przemysl, to the border, um, um, to to collect people at the border, you know, and we we uh, with a train from my region, and uh, and uh, and uh, this, you know, the, the authorities in the south of Poland at the border, they were they were told. 24 hours 
before that we will be arriving with an empty train to to bring people to invite people so, so we asked them to prepare a group of people to come back to Gdańsk with us because you know we only had a slot at the train station of hour or two and everything should have been prepared and and when we came, nothing was, I mean, you know, and Julia can say that that we had to kind of recruit everyone and people were lost and they didn't know what to do with themselves. It was families, it was mothers, it was kids, and they didn't know where to go and whether it's safe or not and what should happen and when will happen and everything. And it's a it's horrible situation. And, um, and yes, so, so my guests uh, for today are Anya and Julia and uh, Julia will uh, so so I wanted like when inviting them I was uh, thinking about the right right to safe narratives to uh, to to uh, save um, this um, verbal sphere but also to physical sphere and how we organize that so I've been working with Julia for uh, for some time already and Julia is an activist and artist but how we met was because I was looking for people who work on representation of, of migrant artists. And I wanted to, to get to know people who work in a political way on, on in arts, you know, politics in arts, politics of representation. So this is how we met and uh, I'm very grateful for this, uh, for this um, cooperation. So, so this is Julia and also Julia, thank you for, <laughs> for being on that train that, that day and uh, that uh, that hours that we were there and then Hania here is a person who's uh, I've heard of for years and that she's in Berlin working with refugees and for refugees and with refugees and engaging communities and with trauma and uh, so I only heard about her and uh, I must say maybe it won't sound good but unfortunately I had to invite uh, Hania to cooperate because there is this war going on now and we need your help here in uh, so so Hania has been helping us with organizing groups and supervision groups and support groups and so on so i think it's a, it's a moment for, for me to give the floor to to Julia you and uh, please say what you'd like to say um yeah first of all i want to thank you uh thank you for invitation and thank you for giving me a voice and also thank you for giving a voice to katya who is in dnipro and all the time she was there in ukraine helping in different cities in different towns uh, with humanitarian help and also i'm i'm so proud of them they still uh, provide and doing their jobs in the center of contemporary art it's like it's a it's a huge it's a it's a it's, they are heroes right now. So uh, yeah, I'm also wanted to to mention this thing about vocabulary and language because uh, it's really re really really important and want to highlight one important thing also that the war in Ukraine started not in February 2022 but in uh, 2014. So this is the second time when Russia invited Ukra invited Ukraine during last eight years. So, and this war is, uh, we, no, we understand this war is a uh, imperial war, the colonizing war. Um, I mentioned one thing, maybe, <clears throat> I think it's important to, to say here, for example, today I heard that the Russian soldiers who raped a 14 years girl uh, all the time during a few days, uh, they said, to them, to, to this girl that uh, they raping her um, to that time that she um, she don't she will not have any sexual relationship after this. That's why they she will not have a Ukrainian children. This is a genocide. I just wanted to highlight it here. So yeah, um, this is imperial war, and this is uh, mm, this is a war about the territories and the power in the world, and uh, also uh, also the thing that um, um, Ukraine we we you used to uh, use the um, term uh, the terminology as post-Soviet countries. So. Um, 
I think it's uh, not post-Soviet, but post-colonial countries. All those countries who, yes, all these countries who were in Soviet Union were colony of colonies of Russia all this time. I, I will not mention the, the history before because we also we, been a colony of Russia before the Soviet Union, but uh, I think this is important of shifting this terminology right now. <clears throat> So, and I also wanted to raise the one question and make uh, this maybe uh, more global or general because I live in Poland for 11 years and I'm from Ukraine. Um, and with one thing that uh, really hurts me right now, uh, two things actually I wanted to say about here. Uh, the one is um, the situation which, uh, when the democracy have its right line, red lines. Uh, I mean, um, eh, here I wanted to say about the situation which I see um, online uh, from from Germany, and I heard uh, about uh, I heard about those uh, rallies from my friends who live in Germany. Uh, the rallies, Russian rallies, in the center of uh, big cities in Germany. Uh, with a uh, forbidden sign Z on the cars and, and the flags and, and so on. And when I see it uh, uh, online, when I see it on Instagram on from through the pictures, I just, the one main question was in my mind, where is the red line of this um, openness of this democracy of uh, giving a voice for everyone? Where is the red line? The second uh, issue which I wanted also raise here is, uh, of course, <clears throat> uh, what about this? Uh, I mean, uh, also I hear even in Poland that we help Ukrainian because like a critic of helping Ukrainian, it's uh, we helping Ukrainian because they are white. And this makes me another question in my mind. <laughs> I started to think about uh, uh, what it, what it does it mean racism uh, racism right now? I mean, in uh, Eastern Europe, can we put all those definition of racism uh, based on the color of the skin, um, which is like mainly Western um, thinking of racism, put it in a context of Eastern Europe? Can we uh, use the same terminology here? Can we use the same senses here? I think not. When Slavic people were perceived as white as, for example, French people in a history. Uh, so this is a thing that I wanted to ask you and maybe we can discuss together here. Uh, sorry for, I, I also may be a little bit uh, tough and, um, and sorry for my English when I'm nervous, I, I just forgot, forget every, everything. But uh, yeah, but I want to just discuss it with you. I think this is an uh, important thing, for, at least for me. Julia, could you give a little bit more? Um, yeah. yeah, two more sentences about what's your, what's your, you know, what's your feeling about this racist thing, and uh, what would be your, your your position on that? It hurts me a lot uh, in position of being an immigrant, for example, in Poland for 11 years, I, uh, I experienced a lot of stereotypes uh, being in Ukraine and Poland, but I think every Eastern European woman or man uh, experienced the same being in Western countries, stereotypes and uh, discrimination. Uh, so yeah, it hurts me so much. It hurts me uh, even being in Poland and hear this in Poland. I, I wanted to, 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 to explain that the Poland, Poland and Eastern Europe is, um, are, uh, understand us more than everyone, everyone else. I, I, because we have a uh, very similar experience with Russia during our history. But when I hear these stories, uh, for example, in the first uh, days of um, humanitarian crisis, crisis on the Ukrainian border, Mm, when uh, and such a mm, there were uh, issues about ra about racism uh, from uh, Ukrainian boards, 
And uh, of course it could happen. I mean, Ukrainian, the same with the, as, a, as a whole Eastern Europe uh, have racism somewhere, but um, the situation were very um, questionable because there is like uh, a lot of border passes and one pass was dedicated to people who are non-Ukrainian living in Ukraine. And uh, there were some cows on, granny, on, on, on the border. And uh, I remember the day, it was like two days on Instagram, on the, on the profiles, which was before, uh, important for me before, like decolonize myself, decolonize this place. But they raised this topic and they screaming about the Ukrainian, which is, our, we are racist. And for me, it was very, it, it deeply hurts me back then. And uh, also it was a huge disappointment for, for me that those people who fighting for decolonizing uh, the world, decolonizing Europe, decolonizing the Western uh, world, they don't understand that we are also part of those colonies and we also fighting for decolonizing from Russia. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, it's uh, yes, it's uh, all strong points, but very, very uh, relevant, very important to be heard and uh, have this chance to to listen. Yes, so 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 it's it's great to listen to you. And uh, uh, Hania, would you like to follow up on on this? Uh, yes. Thank you so much. Um, I will follow up on what I have heard so far. And starting from responding to you, Julia, um, I am now I am like a glue. I think for a lot of topics here, I am currently based in Portugal. Um, my experience of working with people fleeing wars uh, comes from Germany, where I lived before, and I am originally Polish. What you mentioned about colonialism deeply touched part of me as uh, living in England, living in Germany, I have never seen myself as a white person. And what I mean by it, either my skin is obviously white. Um, wherever I would go, I would be first seen as a woman from Poland. Being married to a German man, I heard on a regular basis jokes about being a Polish wife, uh, having a rich German husband providing me with comfort, and me, I am probably someone who is cooking and cleaning. These were also the jobs I have been offered uh, when migrating to England, uh, regardless education, regardless my experience. I was seen as someone from countries that are less important. And um, currently I'm working a lot with transgenerational trauma, with trauma that is embodied in us, in our cultures, and is not related to my life story, but it's embedded in the history. And when I think about Poland, one of the intergenerational traumas is trauma of being unimportant, unseen, not heard, and treated as an object that you can divide, I don't know, into German side, Russian side, that you can treat as something that doesn't have own voice. And I recognize a common narrative here, also with Ukraine, that has been treated in a very similar way. And what this narrative, what this history of being treated as unimportant does to people is that it creates lack of trust. It creates lack of trust to our neighbors. It creates lack of trust to others. It creates lack of trust to someone who has more power than we do. It also creates like this deep embodied inferiority of being unimportant, of, of being somehow less. And we know when you work with children, when you work with whoever, that those who have very low self-esteem very often cover it with certain type of grandiosity or certain type of even going direction abuse or finding someone who is weaker than we are as it makes us feel better. And in this paradoxical situation that we are in now, um, I noticed that part of the narrative is forgotten that for a long time, those who we, who, whom we perceived as even lower than we are were actually Ukrainians. And this is for me a huge shift that I am observing now. I, 
I come from a quite traditional family and I remember one year ago, there was a lot of complaint about Ukrainian workers coming to Poland and perceiving them the way I was perceived in West Europe, Ukrainians were perceived in Poland as those who can maybe do cleaning and work in a construction site, but not as someone with enormous intellectual or any other potential. And now this narrative suddenly shifted towards brotherhood and towards us being united against our common enemy. And why I'm sharing that is that I'm also really curious about what we don't see and what we don't feel when we choose just one easy narrative, one easy explanation. And it kind of brings me also to a topic of racism that you, uh, Julia mentioned, that I noticed that racism become like an easy answer to a lot of very complex problems. Um, when I tried to explain what's happening, for example, on the Polish-Belarusian border to my Western friends. Part of me was fully, like fully committed, fully empathizing with people who are trying to cross to Poland. I have no doubt that all of them should be admitted, the doors should be open, just to, just to make it clear. Um, there is no acceptance in me for any, any wall building. In the same time, I also had part of me that really had compassion for what was happening, for like the border guards, for example, not to agree with them, but to have compassion as a, as a distinguishment between these two, two states. First of all, I remembered my own education in which value of protecting my country, protecting my borders was the highest value you could imagine. I remember when I was a school girl, we went for a trip to Gdansk and we were standing in a group of eight years old children singing this song that, uh, oh, see my see, uh, I will never let you be taken by someone else. I will rather die uh, and lay my dead body at your bottom. And we were eight years old children singing with like full power, this very patriotic self-protective song. And I noticed that we are lacking narratives for how to be successful, how to be recognized, how to be powerful in a peaceful times, how to, feel, um, yeah, how to feel recognized when there is nobody to fight with, when there is no border to protect. So I could also see these men having the time of their life when they can could finally protect the border, even if the enemy was so weak and so vulnerable. So this was a moment when I again asked my question how we can welcome new narratives that are not about fighting, that they're not about protecting, but about building something together, about creating. And um, I haven't yet found an answer that could be good for everyone. I can find answer for myself. And part of this answer I'm finding for myself is also about being here. It's, uh, I find, found this role for myself of facilitating safe spaces for people with different trauma history, not only trauma of war, not only trauma of migration, but uh, different types of vulnerabilities and traumas. As I believe that in a safe spaces, we can thrive, we can connect with our creativity, with our full potential, instead of just using part of ourselves to run the show. And usually it's this part of ourselves that runs the show is the one that it's um, accepted, the one that is welcomed. And maybe I, Add here the last sentence that what worries me is that um, this part that is accepted when it comes to refugees and the, yeah, let's say refugees, my forced migrants, um, is a part that is very obedient, very grateful, very shy, and very sad. Like there is just a bunch of emotions that people fleeing war are accepted to feel. I noticed that maybe because it's difficult for us to welcome anger or welcome rage. Um, we also don't like when people talk about these emotions or when they express them. And this is a natural emotion that people feel when their boundaries are violated. And another emotion or a state that we expect that it's welcome is gratitude. I hear, heard it a lot in working in Germany. This, myth of ungrateful refugee. I think it's even a title of a book that's uh, 
that is, by the way, very good. Uh, I forgot the author, but the title is An Ungrateful Refugee. And what does it mean is that we perceive helping as uh, like this good doing, not as our obligation, not as something that everyone is entitled to, but we perceive helping like, oh, now I'm giving you this accommodation, I'm giving you food, I am giving you whatever, and you are supposed to be grateful and satisfied and you are not allowed to want something else. You are not al allowed to have different values. You are not allowed to have different opinion. You are only allowed to be grateful. And I could talk forever, what does it do to on a psychological level, but maybe I will pause here to not talk forever. <laughs> well, we could listen to you forever, I think. But uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for this, the, the last the last part you were mentioning about this gratitude, you know, this is this is this is exactly the rights, you know, rights versus help paradigm. And uh, and you know, when you look at someone and you know, you give, you help, and you expect, and you you are in a position to expect. It's all about power, power relations, you know, that that needs to be uh, overturned in this in this um, in this um, rights approach. And um, just just one thing to say, I, I I was at a meeting, other meeting today within some project. It's about regions it's about multicultural regions intercultural regions and uh, um yes and the change in paradigm that was that was um, introduced over there is to look at people that they have resources <laughs> and it really brings me to this <laughs> to this you know labor market thinking or you know you it's even hard to put this question over there do, do people have resources or do people have rights <laughs> you know? so i did put that question but it's it's not welcome yes it's so so this is about you know how we how how we can create spaces where we can we can share this um, hard hard news like uh, hard talks and the last point is that uh, when I was uh, talking to Julia and Hania before this meeting we agreed that we have no conclusion to you yes we only share some thoughts and uh, we are um, we I speak for myself shattered in some way so so this is this is what we had to bring and this is this is just some pieces there is no conclusion and we are just in a process <laughs> so thanks a lot Thank you very much, Marta and, and Hani and Julia. I, I can totally understand how it's so difficult to have conclusions. I don't think that for sure is not the objective we have uh, for today webinar in an hour and a half, but already to raise some things that uh, maybe from some people are like really obvious, but in other parts of you are not uh, so much. For instance, what you were saying, Julia, about this white, it is something that, for instance, myself, uh, being uh, many years based in Brussels, been from Spain, being in Spain, you see in the news, it, it, it came as a, a main news, as a bite news that you immediately see and say, oh, how can somebody that is going through such a horrendous experience then being also being racist? And it's like very dangerous words that are very easily put there without thinking maybe the consequences that they can have. For the people that are uh, that are going through 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 this war, and that also what you understand by by white. And uh, thank you very much. And I, I agree a lot with Hania. I think that like, people use this white or these color things, and at the end of the day, it's more the um, power relationships or the economical level and how you perceive the the others of these uh, help recipients. Again, connecting with uh, the human base uh, that very often is, is lacking, as Martha is, uh, was saying, and how we try to find uh, uh, resources in people uh, rather than to think, okay, they have the right to be in, uh, protected. And, uh, and then in the medium and longer term, for sure, we need to, to see how it makes sense for them to be part of the labor market, but not for us to use them as tools for, for the labor market. And I think that uh, that white conception uh, from the Insta, uh, for instance, I think is not so obvious in a country like mine, like in Spain. And I think that at least for, for this webinar and for the communication that we will do after it, I hope that this is a message that can come across 
Uh, we don't have other uh, conclusions maybe, but for sure we have uh, some uh, important insights in this that we wanted to have this as a, as this safe space, as, uh, as uh, you three were, uh, were saying, to, to share and, to, and for us to, to reflect on the, on the power and the consequences that, uh, that words and narratives uh, have when we are speaking about something that is uh, so critical for a human, uh, human by, uh, being's life. Okay, I think, uh, I don't know if anybody else would like to raise any hands or comments right now. Otherwise, um, you mentioned, Hania, that you were in, uh, in, uh, in Portugal right now after experiencing in, uh, in Germany, uh, for instance. And uh, we have also some of our uh, EPIC partners based in, uh, in, in other countries that have been also uh, trying to coordinate. Marta, you've been speaking about how you've been uh, feeling so helpless, uh, how people are trying uh, maybe their, their, their best, but there is uh, this lack of, uh, of coordination, lack of understanding on how to, to, to proceed. So we also want to hear from, from other partners that have been also uh, working on, on the ground, uh, uh, tried also to coordinate themselves with, uh, with other local actors. First, I think Marta, you wanted to, to say something? Just to, just to finish, you know, because I had this feeling, you know, why have I helpless? And uh, I think this is, this is when, when a situation like this happens, it's war and uh, it's so many people and, uh, and you, you stand in front of it. It's very hard to be responsible. And what I see is everyone trying to get rid of responsibility, you know, and, and then you ask yourself, okay, so who will be responsible at the end of the day, you know, and, uh, and uh, also as uh, Hanya was speaking about this empathy, you know, I, I try to be empathetic, it's hard to be responsible in this situation, yes. But uh, but uh, this is this is I think the the problem of the contemporary world in general. You know who is responsible for what and who is showing the direction, and who wants to be in charge of this direction and take a risk, and risk avoiding when when you have when you have uh, all the challenges, all the situations. It's it's very hard to look at. So I think this is this is the hardest lessons that we could be getting now. Oh, but maybe it's it's hard to even say it <laughs> this way, but it's hard, it's tough lessons every day. That's so this is so I just wanted to say about why helpless. Thanks. Thank you, Marta. No, I think this like a relations between uh, responsibility and empathy, it's uh, is something that we also were discussing a lot when we were preparing the webinar, because uh, right now, like we are witnessing everybody in our cases through our televisions, what uh, the situation that people fleeing the war uh, in, in, in Ukraine, but what happened when this ad hoc support on the ground that people trying their best mobilizing is, uh, is not there possible because it's not sustainable because they are running out of funding or because this uh, empathy is there, but it's less there because out of a sudden it's less often in the, in the television and people have other immediate needs to also to be addressed besides the, the consequences of, of the war. So then to have this coordination and this responsibility along with the empathy, empathy cannot be something that is just connected to be the, the news that we are all witnessing and, and feeling this, uh, this sadness and this help us. It has to be something that is accompanied by a human-based approach that is uh, sustainable in the medium and, and, and longer term. But uh, now I want to stop talking myself and to also to hear from our other uh, partners. From, uh... Yes, Christoph. Um, um, thank you for 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 the. Word. I just want probably add one thing from 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 my part. I think it, I, I feel that even uh, it is important for our uh, ourselves to rethink uh, some 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 activities. Uh, because I think we 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 need to to 
to, to, to have another view on, on, on such, uh, such uh, images or such things what we had in the past. And Julia said this, this is really, we heard a lot of colonization about uh, uh, European uh, states, American states, but we don't have that much of uh, uh, colonialism about Russia, but they did. And there are so many in, indigent, uh, small uh, 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 population, even in Russian, but this, uh, uh, but it's really terrible when you go a bit deeper in the, in the, in this, I think we have to, 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 to uh, hold this, uh, the, the, this thematic somehow even from the ground and uh, rediscuss some things, even um, how we should uh, rethink our democracy. Uh, it is even important because we from the Western part or many of uh, uh, people's, what I know that is a kind of even a, a narc an intellectual narcissism what, what I feel in the West. And I think this is not touching the reality. This is a comfort uh, wellness zone, but it's not. But I have nothing to do in what's going on really in Georgia. What is really going on and on this stressful uh, uh, counties? But even and Julia said it's not. Uh, it's not uh, February. It's really uh, since uh, since and, and we, we see this, but we don't act. And uh, it and I feel we even um, was somehow even we are influenced a lot, even in the European Parliament, a lot of Russian propaganda since years and years. And this is uh, how we sometimes feel, uh, feel this. And I think we, we have to keep up this topic uh, and present this topic and to work on this with our colleagues. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think there is a, a, a huge need to work to work on it with the help of the Ukrainians, with the help of Georgian, but with the, even with help from the people from uh, from Syria. Uh, I mean, there, uh, there, there we had the same. So where are the similar experience, what we can share, what happens really now everywhere. We, how, we work on this community, how we can bring this community together, but even let them talk the stories, but what, what's really going on. So it's really, we somehow, I feel we, 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 there is a kind of, uh, um, symptoms what who we working on uh, uh, um, but starts by a fascistic uh, uh, imperialistic system and we have uh, we, we have to deal with them so I, how how we can how can how we can work on this this is i think I, I feel this is this is a contemporary need and i would uh, uh, i will try to to uh, to put my time and energy as much as possible uh, uh, in the next future on these topics Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. Thank you very much. We will be uh, happy to, to follow up what you are doing regarding this, uh, this topic and, and to see if we can organize for their webinars and, and exchange our knowledge transfer among partners uh, regarding this. Um, okay, so I wanted also to uh, to hear a bit from, as I was saying, from some of the other EPIC partners, um, from uh, Marta Carvalho, from the Jesuit Refugee Services in uh, in Portugal. Hi, Marta. How are you? Hello. I, I actually, let me see if I can share it. I made like a very little, it's two slides, PowerPoint, just to make sure I don't forget. Perfect. Any Okay, so we're sharing there you yeah. Okay, because basically since all of this started, um, the the conflict in Ukraine and the results of that is actually very different from all the refugees we have been supporting and like uh, accompanying since the beginning because. Usually when we think about the term and when we talk about refugees, there's people that come to Portugal, let's say, um, with a program. So we know we're going to be having 10, 20, 100 families at this month or whatever. So it's something more controlled. And like we know what kind of supports they're going to have and what kind of supports we have to then uh, give them the services. In Portugal, what happened is the government said, OK, uh, Ukrainian people can come and we will give them the, the status of uh, temporary protection. This means people will have access very quickly compared with any other refugee to the documents. So everything that allows you to be a person, let's say in Portugal, so everything that allows you to work, to have access to health and everything. 
But in a way, it's very good to have your NIST number, your health number, but it's not really like fixing the other problems because you cannot just say, okay, come to Portugal, here's the documents and bye-bye. We need housing uh, systems. We need, people need some, some kind of pocket money. People need help with like integration and everything what's involved because you, you don't just need documents to be integrated. You need uh, Portuguese classes. You need help with employment. You need formation. You need, to, you need uh, psychological support. And then what happened as well is we started to be, let's say a bit overwhelmed because, and this is an amazing thing, obviously, it's very good to see people being very empathic with the situation, being very solidary with the situation. But what we saw here in Portugal is every day, I got like five, six, 10 calls of people saying, okay, I am on a bus and I have 50, 60 people with me on the bus, uh, Ukrainians, and I'm gonna bring them to Portugal. So where do I leave them? And that was very scary because you, you cannot, obviously I understand and it's like doing this journey from Portugal to Poland is like four days driving and it's very expensive and the whole thing. And obviously it's very important to rescue people and the ones that had family in Portugal, this, this was an easy way to gather them with the family, but we actually started to having people that didn't have any connections to Portugal, which is also fine. But it was, it was very scary to us to get a call saying, okay, I'll be arriving in two, three, five hours. Where do I drop the 100 people? Because this, this, this system, this, this support was not created by the government. And us and NGOs, as you know, we, we, we work with projects, we, not, we work with funding. And not having a funding for this is like, how do we help these people uh, properly how do we give them a proper integration like they're going to eat houses it doesn't it doesn't matter because the, the feedback that we've been having is that most of the ukrainian people uh, want to go back to go back to their country once the war is finished uh, and, but for us that doesn't really matter we just want to make sure like if you're here two three four days six months the time that you're here you're being proper integrated you're being you're, you're having the proper support so what we tried to do is actually be present in the in several fronts, the most urgent fronts, let's say. So we started doing some emergency reception and this goes like in, in loads of fields. This can be like being in the place where the, the bus is going to stop and help giving to everyone like legal and social information, giving our contacts, making sure they know what's their rights, what's their duties in Portugal. Because let's say these people, for example, already have housing, so they needed everything else and we just gave that support. We also had, and you can see on the pictures here, we had a bus um, that went and took 100 people from Poland to, to Portugal. And they were gonna arrive very late um, in the evening and it, it was a, a big journey. So we had to create an emergency center in 24 hours. And we actually got a school and the school was, was amazing because we, we created this out of nowhere and we tried to give obviously the, the best conditions possible to these people because this was something very temporary. I had uh, about four days to find uh, houses for everyone. And the idea of the school out, we got mattresses, we tried to make like a little playroom, we got some partners of us to give us food. So to, to make sure people at least could rest after a long trip. And on the next day, we, we had our social workers to, to do the temporary protection for them, for them to have the for them to have the documents. We also like actually had a proper chat with the people to understand, okay, so why why are you here? Like do you have family here? If you do, do you need us just to like help you out to, to get your destiny? What's your life project here? Like so because it's very important and we are looking at the, the Ukrainian situation like individual by individual, situation by situation, because everyone's very different. And we actually had uh, I was I was coordinating that center and we had a very sad situation because when I say there's a lot of events going from Portugal to, to Poland, like I, it's like a hundred of them, which is, uh, as I said, very good, but, but has a very scary place, a very scary side as well, because it's this like um, we start getting people that come here and then once they realize the real conditions of Portugal, they're like, oh, but this is not what I was being told or this is not what I heard. Because obviously now we have like social media, we have everything and information spreads very quickly. And sometimes it's not the, the real information. In the center, for example, I had two ladies. It was a mom and a, and a daughter. The mom was about like 65 years old and the daughter was like uh, 25. 
and the mom had very like um very dangerous like health problems with like lungs and stuff and someone in poland which i have no idea who uh said to this girl okay i'm gonna give you this number and once you get to portugal just call this number and this person is going to get you a job in a hotel and you're going to stay by the sea and don't worry about your mom she can live with you in the hotel and you got free meals and you got the money obviously this for for a girl who's clearly traumatized who has a mom who's ill and she just obviously just wants a place to stay and to be safe and to be healthy uh, this is all what she wanted to hear so she comes to Portugal without knowing anything about Portugal just this like I'm going to get a job and I'm going to have a place next to the sea which is amazing and then she gets to this school in Lisbon and once we start doing like uh, finding housing for everyone I told her okay I actually got a, a very good place for you and your mom is in the middle of the country so it's not near the sea and they're going to support you with everything because this, this is um, in partnership with the municipality. So you're going to have a house just for you and your mom is going to be paid. They're going to help you find a job, the whole thing. But for this girl, it was very like, but this is not what I've been told. This is not what I've been promised. And it, at the time, I was like, okay, but I'm really sorry, but I'm not lying to you. And this is literally all I what I have to give you. And then obviously she got very scared because then she started Googling and she was like, what well, is it very far from the sea? I'm going to stay in the little village. And this was one of the many, many examples that we had of people that came here with an idea. And once they got here, it was like, oh, but this is not what I've been promised. And then sometimes it's very hard to like manage these expectations. And the only thing I can say is I'm really sorry who lied to you because then this girl obviously called the number and no one was picking up. So that was very sad. And we've been having that a lot. Or people that come here and, and they think, okay, but I know Portugal is going to give you some sort of support, some pocket money, uh, because I'm a refugee. And that is that doesn't happen with Ukrainians. So they only get a temporary protection. So the documents, it's very hard, it's very difficult. Sorry, it's very different from having the refugee status. The, the refugees like Syrians, etc., Afghans, they get 150 euros per month. Um, the Ukrainians don't have that. What they can do is they can apply to the social like supports as we Portuguese can. But even then everything is very bureaucratic and very long because even that is hard because they have to, they still have to do interviews. They have to prove to the state that they don't have any money. It takes very long time. And we've been having actually very, 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 very many problems with it, with this part. So people come here with most of them with no money or very, with very little savings. Some of them spend those savings like on the first few days, because then we have people that come on the bus. We have people that catch a flight and come here, then don't know, don't have where to stay. We had people sleeping in train stations and then we get a call because they they check us out online or they find someone that gave us our number. So I get calls every day saying, okay, I just arrived. I'm on the train station. What do I do now? And then obviously we've been trying to always be coordinated with the municipalities, with the police, with everyone to make sure like no one stays homeless. That, that's our main concern. And besides that, no one stays, home, stays homeless. And even if they stay in the house, they're not completely abandoned. Okay, so these people still need help to go to the services. They still need help to do the temporary protection. They might need psychological help. Kids need to go to school, the whole thing. So we made sure we had this emergency reception, even like in centers or just like with coordinating with other answers. We also created something which usually is not great, but here was necessary also taking in account the solidarity of the Portuguese people because we had many, many people offering us uh, their houses. They're like, I have a spare room. I have two spare rooms. I can host a, an Ukrainian family in my house. We did, and this is obviously amazing it's very and we but we also try not to not to i won't say lie but we we try to be very honest with us with the portuguese people because we're saying okay if you're gonna open your house to a family you need to make sure you understand like these people come obviously tired they come sad they they might not be in a very good place physically or mentally or both and you need to make sure like, obviously your expenses are gonna, are gonna go up, your water bills, your food bill, everything. And you cannot expect the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian person, the person you're gonna host is gonna be able to pay for that, at least for now, because they need to find a job and the whole thing. And we have been having, it's a bit of a 50-50 experience. We had people who are now completely integrated, they already have jobs, they already have everything because the community, community really gathered themselves and, 
they actually managed to integrate that person properly. We also had the other way around of people like calling and saying, okay, I've had this person here for two weeks. I cannot do it anymore because financially or because the, the language barrier is too big or whatever. And so they, so they now they want to kick them out of the house and we need to find them another housing like very quickly. Then we also have, because it's very important to have uh, interpreters, we have psychological support, social and legal support. We had, because we this is this is also stuff that we've been doing for the past 40 years since GRIS has been created, giving legal, psychology, psychology support, training. We also created an SOS number only for Ukrainians. The idea is like, um, it's like a landline where you call and you, you're, uh, the person who's going to pick up is Ukrainian, speaks Ukrainian, and can give you the basic information uh, regarding the team. For example, if you say, okay, I'm homeless, uh, straight away they're going to pass it to the services that we have with emergency reception. Oh, I need help to, let's say, to find a job. They're going to pass it to our uh, social assistants. So it's just a, a way of like having someone who to speak with and that speaks your language. Um, we also been trying to give some support on these rescue missions because this is what we felt. Okay, all these people, like all these groups of friends are just uh, renting a, a bus or renting a plane and going to get people, but they don't really know what they're doing and they don't really know what to do after, like where to drop them and what that, what that implies. So we really try to put some order, let's say on this. Also to make sure, because I always like to believe that like, most of the people are good, but we unfortunately we live in a place that we still have bad people and we stuff like tra human trafficking was something that started to to make us a bit worried so we wanted to make sure like the vans that would go to to rescue people would have some like we would do some background research they would we would know they were giving the right informations in poland and stuff like that um then we also created some like strategic partnerships especially with housing and health insurance so the most delicate cases, they can access the, the public uh, hospitals as, as Portuguese, as we Portuguese can. But with this like health insurance, people that have a bit, bit more uh, serious problems can now like ha have access to the private care. The same thing with housing, because here we had people that were working, for example, remotely. So they still have their income, but they just need a place to stay. They need to rent a house. And here you cannot rent houses without having Either, uh, either giving like three or four months of rent, or you have someone to who can pay for you if you don't pay. So we are, we are trying to be that service. Besides that, we are giving like what we always give to any migrant or refugees, Portuguese classes, formation. Um, yeah, I was checking all the points. And then we also created like a, a little warehouse where it's open two days a week. And the idea of the warehouse is open to anyone from, I think it's 4 to 8 p.m. And any Ukrainian family can go, with, go there and just pick up whatever they need. We have clothes, we have like food, we have hygiene products. Because what we felt as well is um, some people that are staying in the, the houses of the Portuguese families, obviously they have a good, some of them have a good relationship and everything, but we felt some stuff are a bit more personal to ask. And like, it's very hard, for example, for a mom have to go and ask for tampons let's say or for baby stuff like that's really putting your dignity at risk and it's very like strong it's very heavy psycho like in a psychology like state so we just open this and we're like it's here we don't really care if you take 10 20 tampons take whatever you want and no one's looking we just have to organize the, the warehouse and just take what you want and we're just getting that donations and trying to keep it all organized and that's Thank that's you. Really it. Thank yes, you. sorry, sorry, I interrupted. Thank you, Mark. I mean, there are so many things that need to be taken into taken into account that, uh, and this needs to be properly uh, explained to people. As you said, there are all this willingness of uh, how can I help, but uh, you need to take into into account uh, that every person is different. That that they might be coming from a very uh, traumatic situation and. Uh, I, I know that uh, yes, with uh, yes, with refugee services has you said has been working for forty years. So you have already this is a strategic partnership that uh, have allowed you to set up something like very quickly, and and then hopefully this will also allow you to in the medium and a longer attempt 
to uh, to to set up something that is uh, that is sustainable and is not forgotten, and that is also other uh, stakeholders and not only the NGOs and and the citizens. Uh, um, boosting this, but also uh, local authorities and uh, uh, private sector and other uh, and other uh, actors. I want it uh, because we are slowly uh, uh, arriving almost at, at the end, and uh, I, I guess maybe other comments maybe for for colleagues. But for sure, I before doing that and before uh, wrapping up, I wanted also to give the floor to our. Uh, colleague and partner uh, Madalena, Madalena Alberti, the director of uh, Ariel Sabidovici in, uh, in Brescia. Um, also to maybe to see if uh, you are um, experiencing something similar to what uh, Marta was uh, presenting from uh, in the case of Portugal, in the case of uh, Lisbon, in, uh, in Brescia, I know that you work closely with the, with the municipality in, uh, in Brescia to try to have this multi-stakeholder answer to a, a very complex uh, situation. So how it is uh, in, in your case, uh, Madalena, and thank you for, for joining. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I will not speak about what I was thinking to speak uh, before okay. because uh, <laughs> I think, I mean, the, the, the exchange that we had till now, it was very interesting. So I really want to thank all the people that were uh, speaking before to me. I found very illuminating uh, the suggestions that uh, you gave us about uh, the use of words. Uh, and Martin Dees is a very special partner in EPIC, uh, recalling as always of uh, giving and investing our attention, uh, the words that we use when we speak. And um, I'm really thankful. I, I'm really thanks to, I really want to thank Marta for this because uh, I learned a lot from her in EPIC and uh, the, the host that she invited today, they were stressing the same. So thank you very much. I think this is very important for all of us. Uh, I just want to say very quickly um, that uh, uh, what is happening here about this Ukrainian situation this Ukrainian uh, war um, is that the, the institutions are basically uh, giving uh, uh, the weight of their responsibilities of hosting and protecting refugees from Ukraine uh, to the families, to the Ukrainian families and to the local families that are here and that are willing to host them for free. And this is something that is very dangerous, I think, because um, for example, in the province of Brescia, we had uh, 6, 000, uh, more than 6,000 Ukrainian people arrived here, and only 130 are in the reception centers. Uh, because all other people are hosted in the families of relatives from Ukraine. And this is very good for, uh, for people because it's family who are united. But what I see working in, uh, with, within the institutions is that this is meaning uh, a full delegation of state responsibilities to the local families. And this is very dangerous because states has responsibilities of giving protection and giving host and reception to refugees and asylum seekers. So, if the solution of hosting, of being host in the families is the best one for the people because they want to stay within the, their families, and I fully agree with this, then the state must find ways to support economically those who are hosting these people and not just give a delegation like, okay, they are doing my job, so I don't have any responsibilities. And this is what is happening basically in Italy, and this is very bad. Um, what is happening also about this reception center, reception center is that uh, the arrival of Ukrainian is uh, um, raising awareness about the terrible situations of the reception centers that are offered user, usually to the refugees. So finally, um, the institutions are going and check who uh, like the, 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 the different hotels and so on and so forth that are used to host refugees here in Italy, because they have a lot of um, 
protest by the Ukrainian about the situations that they find there because they are dirty, because they are not uh, absolutely not, uh, they don't give dignity to people. And this is something that we are protesting against since years, but we were not listened, we were not heard. So now apparently uh, some in, in, in inspections are done also in these centers. Um, but still as an Italian, uh, being in a country um, that is used to receive many asylum seekers from the sea, the question is, what about the other refugees? Two days ago, we had 500 people landing by the Mediterranean Sea, and no one is speaking, and no one is searching a place for them. And I'm sure, and we are sure, that they are in very bad condition, or they are uh, sent back and nobody is checking about this. So I think that the responsibility of NGOs like our working in the field of uh, uh, human rights is to protest against institutions and we are collaborating with them, but in the same way, being the way for them to focus on the fact that the state cannot just delegate the reception of Ukrainian to the families, and in the same time, saying that they don't have space for the other refugees coming by the sea because all the places are taken by the Ukrainians, because this is not true. This is a lie under which our state is being hide just to not take responsibilities. So I just call my, so I'm quite angry about this situation. Um, and I just want to close with the question of Marta before, like who will be responsible at the end of the day? I think this is the question. And the answer should be the state, which is lacking in this moment, at least in Italy. And this is something that we will have to face all together as NGOs. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Madalena. Well, you definitely put there uh, a remarkable conclusion that I think we all, as a network, uh, as a network of network, we need to raise awareness that again it cannot rely on the willingness of the local citizens and uh, grassroots organization. This is not sustainable, and this is not human base. And uh, two things, considering the words that we used when uh, when we communicate about this situation, like this war that started in uh, against Ukraine in, in 2014, not discriminate uh, people and not to make uh, assumptions of racism or, or color of skin and, uh, and, to, and to make clear that uh, the responsibility of ensuring not giving help but giving rights of, uh, of to the people is uh, coming from everybody but especially from from the public sector, from the from the from the state, we are uh, about to uh, to be time up. Um, but before doing that, and besides, thank you enormously to to you, Mada, to to Marta Carvalho, um, especially also to to Hania and to and to Julia. I also wanted to give you back the floor. Uh, Marta, or if also Hania and uh, and Julia, if you want to um, to say some uh, concluding words that might not be the conclusion as we said that we can find, but at least uh, as a conclusion of this hour and a half uh, safe space and uh, and hopefully for the continuation of uh, of King going on on that direction. And, going, uh, and keep collaborating to at least try to to raise awareness and to use these uh, narratives and these uh, and these words. I just uh, wanted to say one thing. I know this webinar is uh, is about refugees, and I understand why I'm here. Uh, but also, I wanted to mention one thing, and I all the time ask uh, about it to my friends from Poland who's very much helping uh, to refugees uh, from Ukraine and uh, and I know I'm very grateful for that but I repeat all the time that we are dealing with two things right now for, at least in my mind uh, from the one side we have a war in Europe a war in Europe 
not a conflict, not a um, Putin's war. No. We have a war in Europe. And Ukrainians, mostly all those Ukrainians who are refugees right now, who um, close their apartment, their homes, even they wanted to come back. And it depends on what and how, how long it will be. And uh, from one side, we have a war in Europe, and from the other side, we have a refugee crisis again in Europe. Uh, and I all the time I, I, I ask for help, not only for refugees, but also for Ukrainians and the people who are in Ukraine, and to help us to stop this war. Thank, Thank you. you, Julia. Thank you. Marta, would you like to say something? For yes, yes, sure. And uh, Hania, you 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 started with the mic, and uh, I was thinking about uh, you know it was uh, accompanying me to to ask you, Hania, about you know like because all all we hear is very very difficult. It's very very uh, it's huge, and uh, so I and uh, you know I was thinking about you know that the task is to somehow manage with this situation you know that you always teach us <laughs> us who, who we work with the groups and uh, you know how to deal with with this experience so that we don't go crazy and we can wake up every day and have this um, i don't know if it's acceptance but it's some kind of force still to to manage and to to move in a constructive way Yes, not to lose yourself in the situation. So, so maybe from and uh, I would say that I heard a lot of these words like scary. It's scary, and I I hear scary, and you know, scary means so many things to so many people. It's scary is different to Julia and different to Katia and different to Marta in Portugal and to Madalena. You know, and like to all, and I I am also scared. So everyone is scared, and it has so many faces. And so maybe <laughs> if you if you could say a little bit about for the for the ending uh, word about how to manage with the scary i would be grateful for that and thank you all for share for sharing being here today and listening just being together thank you uh um that's actually quite scary the scale of the task you gave me now um i can speak for for myself that's probably the most uh, the most authentic what definitely helps me is to define my role in this situation, in this crisis, in this war. And I noticed that when I work with people, when they define their mission, their role, their values, when they are clear about, exactly clear about their values, clear about their role, the boundaries of their role. So in case what is within scope of my influence and what it doesn't, what isn't, it becomes more manageable because it feels helpless, it feels overwhelming if we want to carry the heaviness of it all and then probably also include the rest of the world and it becomes too much. So for me, asking myself this question, who am I in it? What are my values? Where I can use my energy most efficiently also? Because I noticed that when I am not clear about my values and my mission here, I will be constantly invited to like different scattered places and I will end up, I don't know, distributing sh shampoos one day and the other day I will end up supporting someone by phone for five hours. And it's all important, but it's energy kind of scattered. And for example, what I observe in you, Julia, that you speak with clarity, you have a message for the world you want to share. And it's very clear, it's very understandable. And maybe you need to repeat it a million times and you think like, oh, who hears me? Nobody understands me, I just repeat myself. But I can tell you that I hear you and it's very clear to me what you are saying. And I'm sure it's, I'm not the only one. And when you were mentioning, Marta, that you feel helpless, like there was this part of me who said like, how Marta can feel helpless? Like she organized so many groups supporting people working now with, with the newcomers. and in a short time you managed to establish so many groups that are i heard it today from from one of the groups really directly that gives them strength and gives them hope and gives them tools so we are not saving the world so to speak but 
I do feel that when we start naming what we are achieving, like these little things, then we notice that we are not helpless. And um, that's what helps me, this naming what is changing, even if they are like real, really small things. Yeah, that's, that's my preaching now. <laughs> Thank you, Hani. I think that's the perfect message to close this uh, this uh, exchange uh, today. This uh, this message of hope on how we should avoid feeling helpless if we cannot uh, play a part that is uh, going to go in covering the many uh, difficult situations triggered by this war, but uh, still we are like playing uh, our part. And uh, we will try our best, at least, uh, for instance, in, in uh, sharing and trying to amplify the message that you, Julia, has been also uh, sharing with us uh, today and you, Hania. Thank you much, everybody. We have to close. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. I'm, I'm really touched and humbled that you've been uh, dedicating this time uh, to share so personal also uh, stories and, and emotion with us. Um, we'll be in touch. We will set uh, also like some uh, feedback for and maybe like to see if in the future we can uh, find other to keep adding to this role that each of us has for this uh, for this uh, part to play. Thank you very much. Have a, a nice uh, evening, everybody.